Hi Otter Class, well done for surviving your second day of home learning. Um, I thought we'd end it each day with me reading our class book as we would in class as normal. We actually finished our last class book, so our new one is going to be called The Abominables. Okay, I'm just going to read you a bit of the blurb so you know what the story is going to be about. It says, high on a Himalayan mountain, a young explorer is asleep in her tent. At midnight, she is snatched by a gigantic hairy monster and never seen again. Agatha Farlingham has been kidnapped by a yeti, but she soon discovers that he is a brave and noble beast. His family is in danger and he needs her help. Okay, so each day I'm going to be reading you a chapter of the story. And then when we get back to class and school as normal, I will carry on reading our book. Right then, chapter one is called Kidnap. About a hundred years ago, something dreadful happened in the mountains near Tibet. A beautiful young girl called Lady Agatha Farlingham was sleeping peacefully in a tent pitched on a ledge below the summit of a mountain known as Nambidar. Beside her, wearing a green woolly nightcap against the bitter cold, slept her father, the Earl of Farley, and in another tent close by slept their three porters, tough natives of the Himalayas, who carried their baggage and looked after them. The Earl had come to the roof of the world to search for rare and unknown plants, which grew only in these high and dangerous places. He was a famous plant hunter and he liked his daughter Agatha too much to leave her at home in England, doing all the boring things that girls had to do in those days, like painting pictures of ruins or taking walks with their governess or visiting the poor, who often preferred to be left alone. Soon after midnight on that awful night, Lady Agatha was woken by a most strange and unearthly noise, an eerie and mournful sound like a train with indigestion. She sat up pulled her father's heavy tweed jacket around her shoulders and bravely stepped outside. And then it happened. Out of the blackness and the snow, there loomed, a, there loomed a ghastly, gigantic, hairy thing. Before she could even scream, a pair of huge brown arms grasped the terrified girl and then the foul beast turned and, leaping swiftly back up the sheer side of the mountain, vanished out of sight. The poor Earl and his porters searched and searched for many days, risking death in the cruel blizzards and the raging wind. But it was useless. The fresh snow had wiped out all possible tracks. Only a blue bedsock, kicked off by the struggling girl, remained to Lady Agatha's distraught father. He took it back to England, to his ancestral home at Farley Towers, and slept with it under his pillow for the rest of his life. And when people asked him what had happened to his lovely daughter, he always said she must have lost her memory and wandered away and been buried by an avalanche because he simply wouldn't believe what the porters told him, that his daughter had been carried away by a yeti, that vile monster who can tear a human being limb from limb or crunch one up in a single bite, a creature so terrible and fearsome that it is known as the abominable snowman. But of course, the porters were right. Agatha had been carried away by a yeti. He had run with her high over the sacred mountain of Nambidar, and all her kicks and struggles and screams felt no more to his brute strength than the hiccuping of a flea. Until at last the thin air, the bitter cold and blind terror brought release, and the poor girl mercifully fainted. When she came round, she knew at once where she was. There could only be one place as beautiful as this. Heaven. The sky above her head was a marvellous, rich, royal blue with f little fleecy clouds. The grass on which she lay was soft and sweet-smelling and studded with beautiful flowers. Tiny blue gentians, golden primulas, scarlet lilies. Agatha sat up. She felt sore and bruised, but that was understandable. You couldn't die and go to heaven without feeling a little bit uncomfortable. She looked around. The air was warm and she saw trees covered in red and white and cream blossoms as big as plates. There was a stream, crystal clear and bubbly, with kingfishers darting about its banks. Far above her, an eagle circled lazily. She was in a broad valley, surrounded on every side by sheer jagged cliffs and escarpments. And then to her surprise, beyond the steep ridges which surrounded the valley, she saw the unmistakable outline of the peak of Namvidar, glittering white in the early morning sun. Perhaps I haven't died after all, said Lady Agatha. And there was something else that didn't go with the idea of heaven in the least. A few metres away from her, sitting so quietly that she had taken it for a boulder or the stump of a huge tree, 
was an absolutely enormous dark brown beast. It wasn't a bear. It was much, much bigger than a bear. It wasn't a man. It was much, much hairier than a man. And then she remembered a yeti. She had been carried away by a yeti over mountains so dangerous that she could never make her way back alone. She was trapped here in this secret valley, perhaps forever. I should feel terribly frightened, thought Agatha. But feeling frightened is an odd thing. You either feel it or you don't, and Agatha didn't. Instead, she got up and walked quietly towards the yeti. Then she leaned forward and put her hand on the yeti's arm. At once, she was buried up to the elbow in long, cool, silky, tickly hair. Masses and masses of it. The yeti leaned forward. He blew softly with his lower lip to clear away his hair. And then Lady Agatha Farlingham became the first human ever to see a yeti's face. She thought it a most interesting and distinguished face. Yetis have huge, round, intelligent eyes as big as saucers. If you stop and look into a yeti's eyes instead of just running away and screaming, you can't be afraid. Yetis also have snub noses and big ears. And the ears have the most useful flap on them, an ear lid, which they can check close. This saves them from getting an earache in the fierce Himalayan winds and is also useful when they don't want to hear what people are saying. Their mouths are big and generous looking. Best of all are their smiles. Before I had seen a yeti smile, Lady Agatha used to say, I didn't know what a smile was. Not only was the yeti smile beautiful, it was very, very comforting to anyone who might be worried about being eaten. If you want to know what a person eats, look at his teeth. The yeti's teeth were white and even and quite flat, like the teeth of a very clean sheep. And Agatha understood immediately, not only that the yeti wouldn't eat her, but that he couldn't eat her. And in fact, as she found out later, yetis are the strictest and most careful vegetarians. Oh, I like you, said Agatha, holding out her hand. A great burden seemed to fall off the yeti's back. He got up and stood there waiting with his head on one side till Agatha got up too and then he began to lead her along the floor of the valley towards a little copse of slender Himalayan birches where some yaks were peacefully grazing and as he walked Agatha saw that his enormous feet each about the size of a well-fed well dash hound had eight toes and were put on back to front and this of course was why later when people tried to track yetis in the snow they never found them Yetis who seem to be going are really coming, and yetis who seem to be coming are really going. It's as simple as that. Suddenly, the yeti stopped, bent down to a little hollow by the bank of the stream, and began to clear away the dried grass and sticks which covered it. When he had finished, he grunted in a pleased sort of way, and then he moved aside so that Agatha could see what he had uncovered. Oh, said Agatha. Sleeping peacefully, curled up in each other's arms, were two fat, furry baby yetis. She bent down to touch the one nearest to her. Its silly, big feet were pulled round its plump stomach, and when it opened its eyes and looked at her, they were a deep and lovely blue. Then she tickled the other yeti, and it twitched in its sleep and woke too, and its eyes were a rich and serious brown. But the yeti father had begun to look anxious. Something wasn't right. He began to stir the babies round, prodding and digging and turning them over like underdone sausages. And then he pounced, and with a proud grunt, held something out to Agatha. It was another baby yeti, but so small and squashed and funny looking that it might just as well have been an old glove or a tea cosy or a run over cat. And when it opened its eyes and looked at her, Agatha got a shock. One of its eyes was a bright and piercing blue. The other was a deep and serious brown. A wall-eyed yeti, said Agatha in, amazing, in amazement. Later, she called him Ambrose. Here is a little picture of what the yetis look like. Okay, then that is the end of chapter one. Come back tomorrow for chapter two. Bye.